Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming today. My name is Shreya, and I'm a member of the University Lecture Committee. We are a group of students and faculty who work together to find great speakers to come and talk to us here at the University of Iowa. First, I would like to take a moment to thank the IMU for providing us with the space. And today, we get the opportunity to hear from a University of Iowa alum, who is also the winner of the 13th season of MasterChef, Grant Gillen. Gillen graduated from the University of Iowa in 2012 with a degree in leisure studies with a focus on recreation and sports business. During his time at Iowa, he was able to explore different career paths and figure out what he was passionate about. So after graduation, he worked in golf and hospitality industry, and now he works as the director of sales at Kinship Brewing Company in Waukee, Iowa. Driven by the support of his family and his talented cooking skills, he took the leap and applied to compete in MasterChef. And during his time on the show, he showcased his amazing talent and dedication, and he was consistently putting in the work to create a lot of creative dishes. And as we all know, he won, as he won with a three-course meal that highlighted Iowa and Midwest influences. And we would also like to present Grant with the Notable Iowan Award. The Notable Iowan is given to someone from Iowa who has made a lasting impact on the world around them. These notable speakers address diverse, compelling issues that appeal to and inspire students, faculty, and the staff at the University of Iowa and citizens of its surrounding community. It is my personal honor to continue this tradition by naming you our notable Iowan, Grant Gillen. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Well, this is an incredible honor for me. Um, you know, first of all, I want to thank Aaron Schneider, Christopher, uh, my everybody in the lecture committee, uh, and then of course my former professor Dan Matheson uh, for allowing me to be here today. This is something that I don't do a lot of personal, you know, doing these uh, speeches and whatnot. So I'm going to use notes today, just so you know. Uh, but I'm really excited. This is being back on campus today. Uh, we got in about, about 11 a.m. this morning uh, and just has had the opportunity to take in everything that the University of Iowa has to offer. Each and every time I get to come back to Iowa City, there's always something new happening, whether it's the Voxman Music Building or, for me, the opening of the basement of the IMU, because I didn't get that when I was here. <laughs> um, but it is truly an honor to be here uh, and just really appreciate everybody for taking the time to, to come out tonight. Um, so as we, I got a great introduction, which I, I appreciate very much. So again, of course, my name is Grant Gillen. Uh, I am from Altoona, Iowa. I'm still very proud to say that that is where I live to this day, and I'm uh, raising a family with my beautiful wife, Emily. And uh, it's just so great to be back here. I attended the University of Iowa from 2008 until 2012. Uh, I did study under uh, Dan Matheson in the University of Iowa Sport Recreation Management Program. Uh, that really gave me the opportunity to just learn so much more about things that I was interested in. I thought at the time I wanted to be a golf professional. Uh, I thought I wanted to teach people how to play. I wanted to run a golf course, and that's where you know, my mind was going. Uh, that's not where we ended up, but that's okay. Uh, you know, working with somebody, there's so many faculty members on this campus, and I am going to highlight Dan just a little bit here, though, um, that have so much wonderful knowledge to give. Um, you know, Dan has uh, done so much for me, so much for the program, coming from the NCAA, coming from, you know, the New York Yankees, and then coming to the University of Iowa to share all of that wonderful uh, gift that, that he has. So, Dan, just want to say thank you so much for, for your tutelage and, and for bringing me here today. Um, so, why Iowa? Um, I'm proud to say that I applied to one and exactly one university, and it was this one right here. <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. So from, from, uh, from the time I think I was probably five years old, I knew I was going to be a Hawkeye. Uh, my parents, Matt and Laura, met here back in the 80s. Um, they, I think they met when they were working at the uh, dining hall together. Um, and being in this town and being a part of Iowa City and the University of Iowa is just something that's deeply ingrained in me. Um, and so I'm so excited again to be here today and be able to talk a little bit more about about MasterChef, and that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to go through a little bit of my background just so you have a better idea of who I am as a person. 
uh, and then I will get into what MasterChef was like. Uh, at the end of this, we will have a little question and answer period, so please, anything that is not in my NDA, I will definitely tell you about. <laughs> um, and I'm very excited, too. Um, so, while I was at the University of Iowa, I was a member of several different organizations. Um, I was a member of Delta Chi fraternity just across the river here, uh, and I was a part of uh, what I think was really responsible for shaping me as the person I am today in the University of Iowa Dance Marathon. Uh, I was a dancer, I was a morale captain, and then I was able to serve as our sponsorship director when I was a, se uh, a senior. And I think that's what's just so wonderful about this university and everything it has to offer is that you can find where you fit in. And it's really important to go out and find those things that you maybe think you don't want to be a part of or it doesn't make sense to, to, to you at the time. Freshman year, I didn't do dance marathon. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think it was for me. I didn't think that's what I wanted to do. Sophomore year, I was a dancer, changed my life. Junior year, morale captain, changed my life even more. Uh, then senior year being in that leadership role, being a part of something that's just bigger than yourself, uh, you know, gave me almost as much fulfillment as being in one of the dance classes. Uh, but it, it certainly prepared me for the future. So I, I'm, I'm not here to, to necessarily do a commercial for the University of Iowa, but for all the students in here, I think it's really important to, you know, pick up that flyer, check it out, uh, do something that you think you would have never ever done before, uh, because taking those chances for me has just opened so many doors. Um, so I'm just really appreciative of that. Um, and so where does, where does cooking come into that, right? Uh, I wasn't a huge cook growing up. I think I remember being in my, in my grandmother's kitchens, whether uh, I was on my mother or father's side, and they would always be doing something a little different. They would be not reading from a recipe book. They would be doing things on the fly. They would be adding different ingredients here, different ingredients there, and I just I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you know, we get to be probably 10 or 12 years old uh, in my, my mother's kitchen, and I think it was probably about once a week. I don't know if you guys are familiar, little Chef Boyardee pizza boxes, okay? You got the flour, you got the pizza sauce, you got to get your own cheese, I think. I don't think they put cheese in there. Um, and we would make those probably once a week, and eventually I said, hey, Mom, can I, can I help you out with that? Can I, can I give that a shot? And so we would do that and it'd be beautiful, and then I'd say, hey, next time, what if we put a little Italian seasoning in there? right? What if, what if we did a stuffed crust this time? Um, and so that just got my wheels turning. Uh, you know, some people paint, some people sing, some people draw, some people act. Uh, my way of, you know, of being creative is through food. And so that's where it kind of clicked for me there. Uh, you know, moving on, it was, you know, in my, in my college years, I didn't do a lot of cooking. I was, you know, living at places that maybe necessarily didn't have uh, the ability to do that. Uh, I will say one of, my, one of my most favorite times of, uh, of cooking in college had to have been spring break, 2011, Panama City Beach. We just had a wonderful day at the beach in the morning, came back home. I made a penne vodka sauce pasta for my entire fraternity. Shouldn't have done it. <laughs> but that is where I really, again, was just trying to be creative, was trying to be uh, showing, you know, my art and, and what I was all about. Uh, um, after graduation, that's where I really started picking up uh, cooking a little bit more. I was living with my best friend in downtown Des Moines, uh, and we had a really great deal. He said, hey, if you cook, I'll clean everything up. Really nice deal to have. I don't like cleaning that much. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that really allowed me to go outside the box. We were trying different things. We were trying, you know, different flavors of chicken wings. I was learning to make rice correctly. I was learning, you know, to cut things correctly and, and really learn my whole culinary experience. And so that really just gave me that opportunity to try new things and to be a little bit different, um, which is, you know, just has been so fun. And so that kind of continued all through that time I was living downtown. And, uh, you know, I like to think that I, I flourished a little bit in the kitchen there, which is wonderful. Um, so how do I get from that point of just trying to cook chicken wings or rice to getting to MasterChef, right? Um, again, I've always loved cooking. It was something that was really important to me. Uh, back in 2018, uh, I was going through a really rough time in my life. Uh, I had just, uh, I was in the process of, of a divorce. Um, had a brand new three-month-old baby boy. And I didn't know where my life was going at that point. Uh, 
had a really you know, hard time sleeping, tossing and turning, two, three, four in the morning. You know, how am I going to get to that next day? How am I going to get to the next thing? Finally turned on my phone, uh, went to YouTube, and I just was looking for videos. Wasn't looking for anything specific. I wasn't looking for cooking videos. Uh, stumbled across a gentleman named Andrew Ray. Uh, he is more commonly known as Binging with Babish, if you're familiar. Um, and his whole thing was recreating food from really popular movies and TV shows. Uh, and that stuck with me. I think the first thing I ever saw him recreate was the uh, Everything Pretzel from The Office, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with that show. And uh, that was just something that I thought was fun and cool, and that's not how I had always viewed cooking. I had seen it as an outlet for creativity, but the, the cool factor in it uh, is something that really stuck with me there. Uh, then, of course, the next logical person to turn to, none other than Gordon Ramsay. Um, and there was something about those Gordon Ramsay videos that just really stuck with me. And it was the fact that he was able to bring his family into the kitchen with him and share those meals. And that's something that's very important to me. You know, everything I do in my entire life is for my family uh, and trying to support them as best I can. And so, you know, learning from him, even just through a YouTube video, that, hey, this is something that you can do to truly bring everybody, you know, together and everybody... Uh, not only into the kitchen, but to that table, uh, is just absolutely wonderful. And so that's where, you know, this really, really all came from. Um, I started doing a thing every Sunday I called Sunday Supper, and I, I challenged myself to do a different meal that I had never cooked before each and every Sunday. And so that could have been a different noodle dish, or the first thing I ever cooked was beef wellington. And I don't think people usually start with beef wellington, but we just went for it. <laughs> because sometimes you have to be okay with failing. And that's something that I've learned time in and time out. Those Instagrams and those TikToks, those are highlight reels. That's not everything that happens in everybody's lives. Um, and so not being afraid to fail at something, but being able to work really hard at trying to achieve something is just incredibly important. Um, then we get to the happy part of things, okay? So <laughs> I meet my now wife, Emily. Uh, we went on a, a wonderful first date, and I said, hey, I think this went pretty well. <laughs> uh, what do you think about a second date? You come over to my house, I'll make you pasta, okay? So this is something that, again, it's bringing family together for me. It's bringing people together for me. It wasn't for me to show off and say, hey, look what I can do. I can do, I'm a, I'm a guy and I can do this, right? No, it was, it, it's, it's really for me, it's to bring people together and to show them where my passion lies. And having that ability to, you know, bring her in, you, I mean, she, she did a wonderful job. The, the, she had never made pasta before, was able to help her through that, and that was, that was wonderful. So I say, hey, this, this second day went pretty, pretty well. How about, a, how about a third day? She said, absolutely. I said, come back over, I'll cook something for you. So I'm cooking something up. She says, so I have something to tell you. I said, what's that? She's like, I can't smell or taste. <laughs> also, I'm vegetarian. <laughs> so I say, okay. So that's something that, you know, threw me for a little bit of a loop. How am I going to be able to accommodate all of these different things? And so I could have taken that as like, all right, well, let's just have something bland. Let's have a chicken breast and rice. But it taught me to be more creative again. It taught me to cook with texture. It taught me to cook with different temperatures. Uh, and it taught me to really change how, how I plate things and present things so that you eat with your eyes first. Um, Emily is also the driving force behind the reason that I was on MasterChef. Uh, we would always watch not only MasterChef, but a number of Gordon Ramsay shows together uh, and really enjoyed them. And I think the first time was, gosh, probably have been 2019. She said, hey, you got to do it. And I say, absolutely, I'm going to do it. I look online, they're closed for the year. Well, shoot, okay. Well, we'll keep trying, we'll keep learning. We'll, we'll, we'll get ready for next year. Get ready for next year, COVID. Okay, 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 we're gonna push this back a little bit more. But what never wavered was my wife's support and her truly seeing that this was a passion of mine and this was something that I really was working towards and that she wanted me to be a part of. So. Finally, it was the finale of, of season 12. It was last year, we were watching, and after the, the confetti falls for the winner, pops up on the board, says, you know, Gordon Ramsay looks at the screen and says, if you think you're the next MasterChef, go apply, masterchefcasting.com. And she just lays one right on my chest. She's like, <laughs> we're doing it right now. Um, 
And so without that, that support, without that pushing me, I, I, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, I, you know, I grew up as somebody with not a lot of confidence. I never in a million years thought I would be on a TV show, let alone a cooking show with Gordon Ramsay. That's just bananas, right? That's not, that's not for Grant from Altoona. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but again, through her pushing me and just really believing in me, you know, it allowed me to, to take this next step. So now we're going to talk about MasterChef, okay? I'm going to look at my notes real quick just to make sure we're on the right. <laughs> So I am gonna, I'm going to run through several different things that happened throughout MasterChef. Uh, I'm going to talk about different episodes, and I'm going to kind of give you guys an insight into what it was like. Uh, but throughout this, I really want to leave you with three different things. It's going to be about overcoming the odds, facing your fears, and always believing in yourself. Because there was a lot of odds to overcome. You know, I was scared a lot of the time about what I was doing. Uh, and believing in myself was tough. Uh, there's a lot of imposter syndrome, so these are things I just want to touch on real quick. Uh, we'll talk about the odds. 40,000 people applied for season 13 of MasterChef. 6,000 of those people got callbacks from producers. So right away, 34,000 of those people applied and heard nothing. 6,000 of us got callbacks. Then we had to go through a process. We had to send in pictures. We had to send in videos of us cooking. We had to show us plating. We had to show us menu conceptualization because when it comes down to it, anybody can take a picture of a pretty plate of food, right? Anybody can do that. You can go to your favorite restaurant and do that right now. They really want to see, hey, this is you cooking. This is, this is what you're all about. So I'm going through all these. It was probably a two-month process where I'm going back and forth with different producers, them learning about me, me learning about the process. It came to... December 14th, 2022, I get a call. I'm at work. I don't answer the call. It's from a number I don't know. They leave a message. You know, hey, this is whoever from MasterChef. You need to call us back right now. All right, I'll give you a call back right now. <laughs> Got back to them as soon as possible. They said, you have 24 hours to decide if you want to come to L.A. Okay, well, when do I have to go to L.A.? In two weeks. Okay, <laughs> let's figure this out, right? So all of this planning, everything that I've been working for, that I have been striving to do this entire time comes down to this 24-hour period. And it's, do you believe in yourself? Can you beat the odds? And can you face the fear that you have of going to Los Angeles and being in front of all these people? I said, absolutely, yes. So we go. But I say, you know what? They're not going to fly 100 people out there. They're not going to fly 200 people out there. I bet, I bet we get flown out there. We're on the show. We go to audition. No. No, wrong. <laughs> I get to the hotel, and I am met with at least 100 people there, all there vying for the same 40 spots to audition for MasterChef. I'm meeting people from all across the nation, from all walks of life. Some of these people have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers on social media. I'm Grant from Altoona. I have 1,068 <laughs> when, I, when I arrive in Los Angeles. I'm nobody. How am I going to overcome this? How am I going to be able to outshine these people that so many people already love already and nobody knows who the heck I am? And that was tough. You know, it, it really showed me that no matter what, that believing in yourself is what's going to get you far. So 100 of us, of us were there. 40 of us got the opportunity to do live auditions in front of the judges. 20 of us got those aprons. Only one person won. Those are the odds. Start from 40,000 down to one. So where do those odds come in to how my strategy was in MasterChef? Those, those first five episodes, I had a strategy. I didn't know if I was going to be able to execute it, but I said, hey, I don't want to go home first. And it would have been okay. My family would have been just as proud of me if I didn't get an apron or if I went home first as I would have if I won. But I said, I, I don't want to be that first person going home. And so I'm not going to play it safe, but I'm going to play to my strengths. I'm going to be able to do something that I believe in that I know I can do already. Right out of the gates, first episode, state fair. I'm making a pork tenderloin. I'm from Iowa. It's what we do. It's fried. It can be on a stick if you want it to, but that's what we're doing. I knew these dishes maybe wouldn't win me necessarily the, that competition, but I knew it wasn't going to send me home. Some people say that is playing it safe. I think it was playing it smart. I think it was playing those odds. I knew if I got to that top 15, I had a lot better chance 
at moving on in the competition. Second episode. What did we do second episode? Apples. Second episode. I went back to pasta. Pasta's kind of my thing. I love to make fresh pasta. I love to make stuffed pasta. I love to really be creative with those things. So we got apples, and I'm making pasta, and everybody's saying, what the heck are you doing? Like, how are you getting apples involved in this? I said, I can make it work, but I know this is going to be beautiful. I know this isn't going to send me home. But some things I, weren't, I wasn't ready for. The next challenge, we had to feed 101 firefighters. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I cook for usually three or four people at a time. <laughs> 101 was brand spanking new to me. Cooking outdoors on, uh, on stovetops that are made for indoors cooking in 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. I don't know if you guys watched that episode, but I couldn't get those potatoes to boil for the life of me. <laughs> Nobody could have, though. I swear they couldn't have. But that got me down. That was, all right, I'm supposed to, that was the first time I had cried in the competition thus, thus far. It'll be a theme, don't worry. <laughs> but I, I said to myself, like, I'm not going home for mashed potatoes. I can't go home because I can't boil mashed potatoes. Luckily, my team won. We were able to move on. My odds increase, right? Next page. <laughs> uh, so the next thing that I do want to touch on is facing your fears. Um, I didn't know what it was going to be like to cook in that kitchen. Uh, and I had been in there for you know, a few hours already watching other people compete, seeing how everything worked, say, okay, he's going to go to this station first to talk to people. When he comes out, he's going to go over here, he's going to go over here. And so I'm started, I'm going through my whole uh, making pasta. The doors open at the front of the, uh, of, the, of the kitchen, and out walks Gordon Ramsay. I'm like, all right, he's going to go talk to them. He's going to go talk to them. I got five minutes. I can figure out what I'm going to say. Beeline right for me. <laughs> Luckily, I'm needing pasta, and I'm just going crazy. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I, right now, we're, we're, we're needing pasta. You know, they tell you, don't meet your heroes. I'm so glad I was able to meet Gordon Ramsay. Uh, seeing him there, for whatever reason, it was scary, but it gave me a sense of comfort. He was somebody that I learned to cook from. He was honestly the person that I owe everything to for being in the kitchen. And he is standing right in front of me. Now, I have my wife and I have my mother right next to me as well. I'm going to try not to cry right now. Um, you know, they mean the absolute world to me. And to have them there supporting me, being able to see me live out my dream, uh, this was easily the most selfish thing I'd ever done in my life. I had to face the fear of leaving my family for an unknown amount of time. I had to miss out on a couple months of my son growing up. I had to miss out on all the parties. I had to miss out on all the fun things that we had going on, the bad days at work, all of that. But it was for the greater good. And at the end of the day, that's really what was most important to me, is that I knew where my heart was centered. I knew why I was doing it, and I was doing it for the right reason. Uh, people say, hey, would you go do that again? No. No, I wouldn't. Once was enough. But having that opportunity to truly live out my dream and have the support of my family uh, meant the absolute world to me. And that that's said to me, I can do anything. If I can do this, if I can be away from my family, if I can be away from my comfort zone that amount of time, I can absolutely do anything. Um. The second biggest fear, especially for me, is rejection. I'm a, I'm a typical millennial. I don't like to let people down, <laughs> and I don't want to disappoint people, right? And so we go back into that uh, judging room, and it's going to be, hey, are you going to get an apron or not? And very first, right out of the gate, Joe Bastianich, the pasta man himself, he's like, i got to impress him. I made pasta. He's got to love it. He's going to love it. i got to know right away. I can't even tell you what was racing through my mind during that time because that was the person I even more than Gordon wanted to impress. And he gives me a no right away. We end up getting through. I get the apron. That's wonderful. But I told Joe, and I told them, I'm worth fighting for. I'm worth that apron. And I will learn. And I will make sure that you don't regret this at all. Joe said, okay. Go do it. So we did it. 
as I said, being a typical millennial, don't like disappointing people. Uh, there were some times where I had to go out of my comfort zone and face the fear of singling people out. I don't like doing that. <laughs> That's not my thing. Uh, right after I was fortunate enough to win one of the challenges, my advantage was I got to pick teams for the tag team challenge. Uh, for those not familiar, it's a challenge where it is two people. One is cooking, one is sitting on the sidelines. Uh, the person on the sideline cannot touch anything, cannot do any prep, cannot do anything. It is all communication and it's back and forth across an hour. We had to make three different dishes. And so I go out there and I'm like, all right, how do I find that balance between being nice, altruism, and being a part of a competition that I really want to win? Because uh, I still don't want to be, I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be the mean guy. But here I am on national television saying, hey, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, and that killed me to say, by the way, that was, uh, that hurt. Because I am, I do try to be Mr. Nice Guy. That's, that's kind of who I am as a person. Uh, but it's really, the, again, that's that facing that fear for me of, oh gosh, what are they going to think of me? Are they going to, are they going to hate me when we get back to the hotel? Are they going to start bullying, you know, you know, piling up on me? Is this, was, is this going to go wrong? And so facing that fear was, was really, really tough. Um, you know, I think back to one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's from Grantland Rice. Uh, and it's, for, one, for when the great scorer comes to write about your name, he writes not if you won or lost, but how you played the game. And I wanted to be known throughout that entire time that I did it right. I did it by the book, and I did it how I was supposed to be doing it. And so I felt in that point that I embodied that. I was nice when I made these decisions for the for the teams, um, but it was truly about me fighting for myself, and I think that that's shown through. Now we can talk about Hell's Kitchen a little bit. <laughs> uh, for those not familiar, there, every season there's always a restaurant takeover. It's usually around the top six. Uh, so the, usually one person is eliminated, and then everybody else goes to the semifinals. Then you have a chance to cook your butt off to get into the finale. So we are doing the uh, restaurant takeover, not only at an incredible restaurant, but it's Gordon Ramsay's Hell's Kitchen. And it's not the Hell's Kitchen that they shoot the, the TV show on. It is one of his actual Hell's Kitchen restaurants in San Diego. So not only do I have to impress Gordon that I can cook on his line, or on a line, I have to show him that I can cook his recipes on his line. And not only that, because my partner and I had won the previous challenge, I have a big captain C. Right over, my, right over my heart. And so no matter what happens coming out of that kitchen, that's on me. That's being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. It took me back to my dance marathon days that it wasn't just me out there raising money. It wasn't just me trying to you know, help, help these kids and advance this program. It was me being responsible for an entire group of people and making sure that they were doing things correctly as well. That was a big fear for me. I, I lead people in my, in my job. That's something I've done all the time, but this is a brand new experience for me, somewhere I never thought I'd be in my entire life. And now I have to lead, I have to do things right, and I have to make sure that no matter what, it comes back to me. Um, and so I did that. I took a lot of things on the nose. That was two and a half hours of being yelled at by Gordon Ramsay, of never feeling that I could do anything right. Um, but when it came down to it, he would say, hey, who cooked that salmon? Why is it raw? My fault, chef. Hey, why is, it, why is that steak medium, not medium rare? It's my fault, chef. You know, there's no garnish on this plate. That's on me. I may not have been at those stations, but being a leader isn't always about saying, hey, no, they're the one that messed it up. No, I did everything right. I was the best here. Being a leader is not about being the best. It's about being able to show others that you're willing to work with them and you're willing to face your fears and be a part of that. All right. Uh, last thing on fears is I had a lot of unknowns when it came to the editing of the TV show. Now, we are on this set for 10, 12 hours a day. Um, you're only cooking for 60 minutes. That's very, very real. That's 60 minutes is, is all you get in the kitchen. Um, but we're there for 12 hours doing preview stuff, doing B-roll, doing interviews. And I'm probably giving them over that course, you know, six or seven hours worth of me talking, right? and it's pushed down into a 40-minute episode. How are they gonna make me look? I couldn't control that. So that's something I just had to let go of because I knew that if I came out there as Grant and I was just Grant from Altoona, I was a good old Iowa boy, 
that's what it was going to be. I wasn't going to play a character. I wasn't going to be anybody that I wasn't. This was really special to me and really important to me to be exactly who I was. So coming over that, overcoming that fear was quite a big deal for me. Uh, the very last thing I want to touch on of these three is believing in yourself. Uh, before I left for uh, Los Angeles, my mother, <laughs> I'm going to cry now, sorry guys. Uh, my mother and father gifted me a bracelet. Uh, I still wear it to this very day. Uh, I look down and it, it says, believe in you like I do. Um, I told you at the beginning of this, I have a hard time believing in myself sometimes. I have that imposter syndrome. It's not something that I am good at. I don't accept compliments well. I don't always believe that, you know, those things are deserved. Being up here tonight is still just absolutely crazy to me. And I'm so excited to be here. It was hard, but throughout this entire competition, it was, again, focusing on my family, overcoming those odds, facing my fears, and then believing in myself. I had, for those that watched the season, I had two episodes in a row that I was in the bottom three, and I could have very easily gone home. I'm very lucky those were on the same night. I didn't have to relieve, re live that over two weeks. It was just on one night. But that first one, uh, the first one was the fish challenge. And that was a point where I thought I was doing okay. I, I, I was doing some things I thought was really fun. I'm like, hey, these, these guys are going to like this. Uh, Gordon comes up to me as it becomes apparent that I am not doing well. And I can only imagine that there's a producer in his ear and he's like, hey, Grant's really messing this up. Can you go remind him that his family, or he misses his family, go make him cry real quick? So he comes over <laughs> and he references my bracelet. And he talks to me about it. He says, you know, where'd that come from? What's it say? And so I have to go relive that. I start crying on national television. I told you it'd be a theme. But then it got me thinking, no matter what, I'm going to get through this cook. Whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether they love it, whether they don't, I'm going to get through this because I believe in myself and because I have my entire family believing in myself as well. I didn't go home. I don't think I should have either. I thought I was very creative. I thought I did a nice job. But I'm like, you know what? Next time, we're going to get out there. We're going to show them what it's all about. Next episode, stadium food. We have to recreate and do some very elevated stadium dishes. I said, oh, I got this. I got the idea in my head. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I cooked a beautiful pork loin, or a beautiful pork shoulder in the pressure cooker, beautifully spiced, have different salsas, have a queso, made my own masa, going to make some tortillas to make these things called tatelas, which is basically a stuffed triangle of, uh, of corn dough. Undercooked the dough severely. I thought I had this in the bag. I'm like, guys, this is nobody, nobody is thinking like I'm thinking right now. This is the absolute best thing that's going to be coming out on this stage today. You know, they come up to me, they're saying, huh, did you cook it right? They're, they're pinching the corners of these little tatelas. Like, did you cook that right? I'm like, yeah, yeah I did. Absolutely did. First person up, we think, did not have the best dish tonight. I'm like, all right, Kyle, this is you. <laughs> Grant, I'm like, what? I'm like, uh-uh, this is, this is amazing. Do you see what I just did here? You know, they brought me up. They tore me apart again. That was tough hearing that twice in a row, that not only did you do a bad job last week, which was yesterday, um, <laughs> but you also did a bad job again today. And they say, Grant, what are you thinking? Are you doing too much? Are you trying too hard? Are you being too cute? Are you trying to do things that you are just not familiar with? I said, yeah, probably. But that's why I'm here, right? I need to believe in myself. I need to take chances. And this one didn't work out. I think this is the best conceptualized dish that you see across everybody behind me, but I didn't execute it. So that hurt. That hurt really bad. Uh, when it comes down to it, that clock starts. When it's going to start, and it's going to end in 60 minutes, that's the only time I have. But then, as I talked about Hell's Kitchen before, I didn't go home. I did a good job of leading that team. I don't think I should have gone home there either. It's good. Uh, but we get to the semifinals. I know there's going to be two challenges that day. You're going to have to get through both of those to have the even have the chance to cook in that finale, to be able to cook exactly what you want to cook, to be able to show each and every person, this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is what I'm all about. So we walk into that kitchen on the first day. Everybody has, has a, uh, or there's, there's four cloches up on the, uh, in front of the judges. I have no idea what's going on. 
We go up one by one, different pasta doughs. I say, <laughs> I got this one in the bag. That was the first time in the six, seven weeks that I had been there that I truly felt confident and that I could believe in myself in the kitchen. Pasta's my thing. I can do it in my sleep. They already made the dough for me. This is even better, right? I look back and I say, I could have been believing in myself the same exact way each and every time I stepped into this kitchen, but this is comfort for me. This is where I'm at. Now, some of the other people, uh, my other competitors had incredible dishes as well, uh, but I think the technical ability that I showed just because of being able to believe in myself and having that confidence in what I was doing uh, absolutely shown and, and really show those judges that I'm here to play. This is what I can do. Uh, so I make it through that round. I have a squid ink pasta. I filled it with some beautiful uh, crab and clams, nice white wine reduction sauce. It was beautiful. I put three clams on the plate. I'm never going to do that again. Um, Joe said no go on that one. So again, learning, taking those on the chin, learning each time I'm out there. And then, you know, they're, they're telling us in between, they're like, all right, one person went home. We're down to the top four. You guys know what's next, right? I'm like, no. <laughs> I have no idea what's next. They're like, you watch the show. You know what's going on. I'm like, yeah, I watched the show. I have been in just a daze for the last two months that I've been here. I have no idea what's coming next. They pull us out onto the stage. Everybody's lined up in a row. And out walks Gordon Ramsay and his chef whites. And I say, uh-oh. <laughs> We're going to have to keep up with Gordon Ramsay. And so, for those that, again, that aren't familiar, this challenge is completely predicated on following Gordon Ramsay as quickly as he goes. Now, he's, he cooks fast, usually. He's very good at what he does, but he was speeding through each and every step that we had. But I had an advantage that these other people didn't have. He's the one that taught me to cook. He's the one that I would follow his YouTube videos, follow his recipes, and try to keep up with him each and every time I was in the kitchen. I had stuff all over my hands. I couldn't press the pause button, right? <laughs> I had to get through that each and every time. So it was believing in myself there that I knew, hey, I got this. I can do this. All I have to do is watch. Take it in and listen. That's what I did. I'm a little hard of hearing, and so I was really worried about this challenge. This is something that he's going to be firing off things left and right, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. There's a beautiful... Uh, snapshot, if you will, during that challenge of me doing something, cooking. Everybody else has their backs turned to Gordon, looking for who knows what. But I was in tune. I was there because I believed in myself. That's what I was supposed to be doing. All right. So let's get into the finale. Uh, the, uh, the finale is certain, certainly somewhere that I never thought in a million years I would have made. Uh, I thought the fact that I even got a call back from the producers at the beginning of this whole journey was just incredible. The fact that I got to fly out to L.A., okay, that's cool. Oh, oh, I got an apron. Okay, let's keep moving those goalposts. Oh, I made it top 15. Oh, I'm top 10 now. Holy shit, I'm in the finale. <laughs> right? It's, it's all of these things coming together. And I said, well, if I got to do this, I'm going 100% grant. I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'm going to do things that I believe in, things that represent me, represent my community, and make sense on a menu. Uh, and I did just that. I said, hey, I'm going to take my Italian heritage that I'm so very proud of, and I'm going to marry it with the Midwest, which is what I have on my chest, what I've been representing this entire season, and I'm going to show you what I was all about. Okay? So I take that, that first uh, that appetizer, beautiful egg yolk ravioli. It's a classic in MasterChef, and it's very easy to mess up. Pair with some beautiful morels. Now, I know morels are from everywhere, but if you're from Iowa, you know, I think I told Leron I was hunting them down by the creek. That's where we get them, right? Each and every spring. That's one of my favorite times of the year when those come out. And he said, does this really represent Iowa? I said, 100%. He's like, well, I get these in California. I said, I don't care. This is Iowa. You can get everything everywhere. That's fine. This, this is me. The next dish, my competitors were going I don't know, a little nuts, honestly, with, uh, with their proteins. Uh, Jennifer was cooking, what was she cooking? Jennifer's cooking venison, and that's something that before my cook-along with Gordon Ramsay, I had never cooked before. 
Um, Kennedy made Rabbit, which was impressive as all get out, right? Like I, that would never even entered my mind as a possibility. Uh, but I'm stuck here with a humble pork loin because that represented me. That represented Iowa. That represented the Midwest and what we're all about. We're the number one pork producing state in the country. We're the number one pork producing region in the country. This is what we're going to show off. I bring in some Italian things that didn't necessarily make sense on the plate when you think about a pork loin, but everything together came and told that story of Iowa. Uh, then I went full Italian on, uh, I was trying each and every time of this, of, of my menu, to try to really figure out how am I gonna bring Iowa, bring myself, and bring Italy you know, into this. So I say, hey, gotta do a coffee dessert. That's what Italians do. Let's do an affogato. I say, how am I gonna tie that into my family? I'm like, well, uh, I have a four-year-old, and I have a beautiful wife. Uh, that four-year-old likes to wake up early in the morning, right? So each day starts with coffee. We all go off and do our own thing. We all have good days. We're all good boys and girls. We're going to end that day with some ice cream. So putting that together, that brings us the affogato. And so while that didn't necessarily you know, translate directly to Iowa, uh, that meant a lot to me and to my family. Um, and so that's where all that came from. Now, those were tough. You had one hour cooked three different dishes, and I told you earlier I'm a golfer, and I love to golf, I'm all about that. On that circle, in that finale stage, it's all about yourself. I can't make somebody else make a bogey. I can't make somebody else miss a shot. I have to do everything for myself. That is my stovetop, those are my pans, those are my knives. I have to do absolutely everything to overcome this. I've overcome so many odds as already. I've overcome each and every odd along the way. I'm in the top three right now, right? I've faced each and every fear that I've encountered throughout this entire production, whether it was just getting to, the, getting to LA, just you know, figuring out who I was as a person and, and figuring out how to, how to maneuver in you know, this, this limelight that I was in. Uh, and then truly believing in myself. I knew that after my, on, or I knew as soon as I finished my dessert, I won. I knew that there is, if, if I didn't win, that, that's fine, but I knew that I won because I had overcome every worry that I had had throughout this entire competition. I knew at this point there was nothing I couldn't, there was nothing that I couldn't do, there was nothing that was going to hurt me, and there was nothing that I truly wouldn't, you know, I, I just knew at that point that this was mine to lose, and, uh, and I did everything that I could. So, at the end of the day, again, I want to leave you with those three things. I want to leave you with, no matter what happens, there's going to be a lot of odds that are against you. It's if you're applying for an internship, if you're applying for your first job, if it's trying uh, out for the, for the cheerleading squad, right? If it's being a part of, of dance marathon like I was. There's going to be a lot of odds stacked against you, a lot of people going for the same thing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. That means you should try just that much harder. Believing in yourself is my number one thing. It's no matter what you do, hey, I may fail at this. I may not be good. That's okay. That's okay. Again, those social medias are highlight reels. Each and every person in this room has failed. Each and every person in this room has succeeded as well. So no matter what, keep going on with that. We overcame the odds, we believed ourselves, and then facing our fears. Life's scary. Doing different things that you're not comfortable with, it's really hard. Uh, and sometimes you don't feel like you can continue on, but just believing in yourself, Overcoming those odds helps you overcome those fears and face them each and every day. Um, that's what I have for you all today, uh, and I really appreciate you listening to my story. Um, I'd love the opportunity to open this up for any questions anybody may have, uh, and again, I will answer those to the absolute best of my ability. Uh, but truly, this has been an honor to talk with you all today, for you to listen to my story, uh, where I come from, um, and hopefully where I'm heading. You can ask that question if you want. Um, but, but truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for being here tonight, and I genuinely appreciate you.
<laughs> yeah, no, so the question is wh where you can try my food, is that right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So right now I am in the process of opening up some pop-up dinners uh, in my hometown of Altoona. Um, so right now I'm keeping them local because that was really important to me. The city uh, that I was born and raised in, my hometown, they have supported me throughout this entire endeavor. And so uh, for these next probably three months over the winter, I'll be hosting six to eight pop-ups um, at, uh, at a local uh, golf course, Terrace Hills Golf Course in Altoona. Um, there are prefix menus right now. I only have one available. We're down to six seats left for December 7th. Um, but I will be posting more uh, upcoming and then hosting some brunches next year as well. Um, I really want people to be able to have access to my food, um, but I want them to also have an experience that they can't have everywhere else. Uh, you know, coming to, to eat, with, uh, eat with me is going to be not like just going to a restaurant. It's going to be, you know, very different than what you're, you're used to, and I really want to be able to show that. So um, as of right now, that is the best way to try my food. Uh, the goal is to open a restaurant eventually, uh, but I know that I need to learn everything I can about that. You know, even good restaurants fail. And so I want to make sure, I've never worked in a restaurant before at any, at any level. I've never been a server, I've never been a bartender, I've never cooked on the line, anything like that. Uh, so I'm gonna, over the next several months, I'm gonna be working in kitchens in Des Moines so I can learn as much as I can. I'm gonna go back to be doing prep for people. I'm gonna be working on the line. I'm gonna be doing food ordering, and figuring out food costing, all those things, because I don't know that yet. And I'm not afraid to say that, that, hey, you don't know what you don't know, that's okay. But I need to learn that, and I need to make sure I can be the best that I can be before I open anything permanent. That was a really long answer to that, sorry. <laughs> Well, just thank you so much for coming here. I'm a huge fan of Master Chef and was cheering for you since the audition episode. So thank it's really you. Really surreal, surreal to have you here. Um, one thing that has always kind of been on my mind um, from watching Master Chef is whenever there's a certain challenge, especially baking, like souffles or cakes, there's always one contestant who's like, I have no idea how to make this. Never made this before, but they are somehow able to produce mm -hmm. the thing. And I've always kind of thought. Do, do they have training between? Are they given recipes? So um, do they offer you any kind of studying while you're there? Yes. So we have the ability and access to a lot of recipe books. Um, and so we don't have them available while we're out cooking. So we don't, you know, you know, it's everything you have to commit to memory. But, you know, I think everybody comes in, to, uh, most people come into MasterChef not being the best bakers. They're there to be, to cook. They can do very good savory things. They can do a little bit of sweet, but that's not really where everybody's, you know, focus is. And so I know for us specifically, when we got to that hotel and there was a room just full of, of books, everybody dove for those cakes. <laughs> everybody dove, you know, for all those different uh, things because we knew that was going to come up. And I had it committed to, to memory. I probably up until probably three months ago could have told you exactly how to make a chocolate cake with a ganache uh, to the gram out of my head uh, because I had to. So yeah, it, you know, having that ability to, uh, to have those recipe books and just really, you know, what else are you going to do? You're there to be on MasterChef. You're there to try to win as best as possible. So it was a lot of hours uh, studying and memorizing a lot of different books. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned <coughs> some things that uh, you didn't feel you quite mastered yet about the marketing and all uh, the stuff about how to promote your thing. You mentioned Joe Bastianich. Uh, is he related to Lydia? Is what? Is he related to Lydia Bastianich? That's his mother, correct. Okay, well, <laughs> it seems like she started uh, from nothing. Yeah. Uh, she built an empire, more or less. I was wondering if you could consult with her. She, I think she just <laughs> seems to know everything. And I'd I love to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Joe is one of those people that uh, I think a lot of people maybe don't like him or think have a certain idea about him because of how he acts on the show. Um, that man has, you know, that man has passion. That man has standards. Uh, and I think he learned a lot of that from Lydia. He learned a lot of that from his mother. Uh, for those that don't know, in Kansas City, uh, Lydia's, it's a wonderful Italian restaurant, uh, started by his mother. Um, they uh, immigrated from the country formerly known as Istria, I believe. Um, and so he has that Italian, um, Eastern European uh, background to him. And I, I agree with you. I, yeah, if, if Lydia wants to, uh, wants to chat, I'm open to it. Um, but I, I agree that, I mean, that family has done so much, and he's obviously learned so much from his mother on how to 
create an empire and how to be a restaurateur and how to know, you know, what each and every person likes. Uh, can, can we look forward to any uh, a menu cookbooks? Sorry? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, can we look forward, are you thinking of uh, cookbooks? Yes, yes. So I'm in the, uh, I'm in the process right now of, uh, of pitching different cookbook ideas. Um, for those that don't know, I love to cook with my son. Um, and so I'm looking to do some uh, children's cookbooks as well, um, but then also bringing in that Midwest and that Italian heritage together. So um, working on those right now probably would not be out before the uh, probably Christmas time next year uh, is kind of what I'm aiming for right now, but uh, definitely in the works and definitely something I'm looking forward to sharing with everybody. Can you tell us a little bit about like what was the first day like coming back like in Altoona, having known you won this huge award but not being <laughs> able to tell anybody? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I was on I was on a plane back home 12 hours after I won. Uh, <laughs> we were done super late at night. Went home, went into the hotel, slept back on a plane. And so less than 24 hours after this confetti fell around me, I was given this award. I'm back home, and I'm happy. It was great. I got to be honest with you. Being, you know, walking in that door, I think I collapsed on the couch for probably an hour. I could have gone up to bed, but it was just being there and being home. And then, yeah, then I wake up the next morning, and I'm like, nobody really knew that I was gone. <laughs> like, you know, my, my, my work knew I was gone. My, my close friends knew I was gone, but I couldn't tell them why. They didn't know why I was gone. I had to come up with some, you know, hey, here's why I'm, you know, got some outside work. It's like, you work for a brewery. What are you doing in here? Don't worry about it. It's, 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 it's research. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was tough. And I, I, I really think the, uh, you know, the big story is that my, my four-year-old was able to keep a secret for six months as well. Uh, <laughs> because that was, uh, that was not easy. There was a lot of bribing. Um, there was a lot of, hey, we're keeping a really good secret, and it's a present you get to give to people eventually. But, you know, it was, uh, it was surreal. It took me probably another two, three weeks before I was able to go back to work uh, just because, I mean, it was... I mean, it, it, in, in an okay way, but it was, it was a trauma situation when being in, you know, being in Los Angeles for that amount of time and being, going through all these emotions each and every day. Um, and so it was, it was rough for a while. Um, and then when I finally got to tell people, hey, hey, I'm on the show. I'm on the show. Then it's like, oh, okay. Nobody's going to think I'm going to win this thing. So, hey, now I just get to have fun with it. And I'm just going to say, hey, you're on the show. And it's like, uh-oh, he keeps going. He keeps going. He keeps going. It's like, did you win? No. No, nah, I don't know, you know, somebody won. We'll love to see. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it was great to be back home. It felt wonderful. Um, I, I'm proud of myself for not telling anybody. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was definitely hard to keep that, you know, from so many people. Luckily, my family was there and I was able to watch it. And I had somebody to talk to <laughs> about it. But um, yeah, that was definitely a, a, a fun experience coming back home. Um, kind of leading up to the show, obviously, you probably spent a lot of time practicing your dishes and cooking. How did you balance, like, with your job and pr putting on all those hours cooking and working on your craft? And when you made mistakes, how did you, you know, how did you balance your work and then making another dish using your time like that? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Uh, I, I sacrificed a lot. I sacrificed time with friends. I sacrificed time with family because I knew these were things that if I was going to do this, I needed to take it seriously. I'm not going to go out to LA and be like, oh, shoot, I forgot to learn how to make a souffle before I got out here. Like, you know, how am I going to learn to do that now? Um, and so it was, you know, it was, hey, I got to work these 40 hours during the week. Uh, but when I'm not home or if my, you know, son is at, you know, his mother's house, we'll that's, that's my time. My wife was so gracious to allow me all the time in the kitchen that I needed. Um, and uh, <laughs> and that's, that's where I lived for honestly probably about the, the month and a half, two months that I was, you know, trying to, to get on this show. And, you know, the balance was tough. Uh, but luckily, like I said, this is kind of my creative outlet. This is where I get to have fun in the cooking world. So it never really felt like another job to me, which was great. And, you know, that's kind of my goal moving forward is, you know, if I get into into cooking and I, get, I open up a restaurant, it's got to be for the right reasons, right? And it's got to be something that I still enjoy doing because if I don't enjoy doing it, it's not going to come through. The passion won't come through and it won't be what I want. So, great question. 
Okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you again for coming to speak to us. But I was just kind of curious on cooking shows and on Master Chef as well. Just about the camaraderie between you and other um, competitors and other participants, and if your relationship with them affected how you interacted with them, especially during competitions, and then also if you keep in touch with any to this day? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. We were told that we were the closest cast that they have ever had on the show. Um, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was because we were all kind of representing our own regions or if we were just all there for the right reasons or the same reasons, uh, but we all just clicked. Um, and I think you're right. It did kind of affect how we you know, how we interacted with each other while we were cooking and then outside of the, the kitchen as well. It was, we would clap for each and every person and we meant it. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, yeah, good job. Get up there, you know, James, good job. It was like, holy crap, my friend did this. Um, and so I'm really happy to be able to call pretty much everybody from this season my friend and people that I still talk to. Um, from the this, from this season, I was definitely most close with Colby and Bryn. Uh, those were two people that I just really connected super well with. Um, those are people I'm texting on a weekly, if not daily basis. Um, but yeah, we all, we all still keep in touch, which is really fun. And, you know, we're at the point now where we're all kind of doing it's kind of the same thing. Like, hey, I'm doing a pop-up or, hey, I'm trying to open a restaurant or I, I have this idea. I want to do this. Can I bounce some things off of you? And so I was able to expand my network by 20 just wonderful cooks and now into chef, you know, hood, if you will. Um, and I just have that now ability to, to kind of bounce those ideas off of them. So, yeah, I keep in touch with, you know, each and every person as much as I can. And it's just really fun to be able to have that and, you know, have that, that thing that we all bonded over. So, yeah, that answer good. Hi, I was wondering which challenge did you find the most difficult, but also what is Gordon Ramsay like in person? <laughs> Perfect questions to end with. Um, you know, the ones that were most difficult were ones that I felt like we kind of were in a box with or it's something that seemed almost too easy, if you will. The fish challenge, that was tough for me. We all know that. We watched that episode. But it was like, oh, I have to cook fish. How do I make this something really cool or, you know, oh, it's, it's apples. What, what am I, what am I going to do with this? Right. Um, but I think the ones that allowed me to like think way outside the box are the ones I enjoyed the most. That MRE challenge was of course one that I was able to win creating gnocchi out of hash browns with bacon and peppers out of a meal ready to eat and, you know, lentils, lentil stew into a beautiful puree. But, um, those were the ones where, when I got to really think outside the box that I had, you know, a lot more fun doing. Uh, and Gordon is everything you think he is and more. Um, you know, you see that, that fiery passion that he has in a lot, of his, uh, a lot of his TV shows, a lot of previous TV shows. And, you know, he has that. That came out in Hell's Kitchen for sure. Uh, but what I loved the most is after each, you know, the cameras were off. Um, we had the episode was done for the day, especially in the first probably 10 episodes, he would come out and if they didn't, if you weren't in top three or bottom three, they really didn't talk too much about your dishes. He would come out and tell each and every one of us what he liked or what we could have improved on or what he maybe would have done. And that was invaluable information. That was him really coming out and saying, hey, this isn't for the cameras. I'm not trying to be Mr. Nice Guy here. This is me really wanting you all to be the absolute best that you can. Um, and so, you know, I said it earlier, you know, they say never meet your heroes. I'm so dang glad that I was able to meet Gordon Ramsay because he is everything I could have hoped for and more. Thank you all so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions. So can we give another big round of applause? Thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you.